It's perhaps the greatest mystery of the 21st century, or maybe of all time. Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 was flying 227 passengers and 12 crew members on March 8, 2014, from Kuala Lumpur International Airport in Malaysia to Beijing Capital International Airport in China. The crew of the Boeing 777-200ER last made contact with air traffic control 38 minutes after takeoff, whilst flying over the South China Sea. Minutes later, it disappeared off ATC radar screens, but it was tracked by the military radar for a further hour, heading westwards from its planned flight path. It vanished 337 kilometers northwest of Penang Island in northwestern Malaysia. With everyone on board presumed dead, the accident was the deadliest accident involving a Boeing 777, and it was the deadliest incident in Malaysia Airlines history until MH17 was shot down over Ukraine four months later. So the search for the aircraft was recently concluded, and as a result a final report was released. It consisted of over 400 pages, however there are many gaps regarding the disappearance of the plane. So what exactly happened to MH370? Well, we still don't know. Flight 370 was an early morning flight, one of two daily flights operated by Malaysia Airlines from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. It was scheduled to depart at 35 minutes past midnight and to arrive at 6.30 am local time. On board were 227 passengers, 10 cabin crew and 2 pilots, totaling 239 people. The flight was scheduled to take 5 hours and 34 minutes consuming 37,200 kilograms of jet fuel. The aircraft actually carried 49,100 kilograms of fuel, including reserves, allowing it to fly for a total of 7 hours and 31 minutes if a diversion was necessary. Now at 42 minutes past midnight, Flight 370 was cleared for takeoff from runway 32 right by ATC, and it was cleared to climb to flight level 180 by departure afterwards, or approximately 18,000 feet. Standard instrument departure clearance for MH370 was cancelled by air traffic control in order to allow the aircraft to fly on a direct heading to a waypoint called Aigari. It should be noted that this is a perfectly safe procedure, and after a standard departure, the flight was handed over from departure to Kuala Lumpur radar. At 46 minutes past midnight, MH370 was cleared to climb to flight level 250 and subsequently to flight level 350, which is the cruising altitude for this segment of the flight. At 1.19am, MH370 was instructed to contact Ho Chi Minh control on radar frequency 120.9 MHz. MH370 acknowledged with This was the last recorded voice transmission from the flight. Radar showed them passing through waypoint Aigari one minute later. The last civilian radar contact with the aircraft was seized at 1.21 am. The Malaysian military radar and the radar sources from Vietnam and Thailand also saw the aircraft drop off radar. The last ACARS transmission was made at 1.07 am. ACARS is used to transmit information from the aircraft to the ground via satellite. As it stands, it seems the transponders and ACAR systems were intentionally turned off. However, we'll cover this later in the video. Now, military radar data provided extensive data. However, the altitude and the speed data extracted between the blips of the radar showed values far outside the performance capabilities of the aircraft. 
The only information that can be used practically are the latitude and the longitude locations of the aircraft. The radar showed the aircraft briefly turned right before a left turn heading 273, flying parallel to airway M765 to VKB. For the next 15 minutes, it showed the aircraft making heading changes that varied between 8 degrees and 20 degrees, and a ground speed that varied from 451 to 529 knots. It also recorded a significant height variation between 31,150 feet and 39,116 feet. At one point, the blip showed the aircraft at 47,500 feet, which is far above the 43,100 feet service ceiling of the 777-200ER, making this data highly inaccurate. At 2.01 am, the data showed the blip on the heading of 022 and the altitude of 4,800 feet. Another military radar station supported this data. At 2.03 am, the blip disappeared and reappeared at 2.15 am. A possible explanation for this is that the aircraft was too low to be detected by radar. However, the reason for this is unexplainable. The final radar contact with the aircraft was made at 2.22 am, which was 1 hour and 40 minutes after takeoff from Kuala Lumpur. It continued to make 7 hourly handshakes with SATCOM reporting its location. However, the last handshake was incomplete and this was the last contact with MH370. The pilot in command was born on the island of Penang. He joined Malaysia Airlines as a second officer in 1983 and was posted on the Fokker F-27 where he obtained flying experience. Two years later in 1985, he was posted to the Boeing 737-200 and the Airbus A300B4 where he stayed on as a first officer until March 1990. Just four months later he was promoted to captain and took command on the Fokker F-50 aircraft. Just under two years later, he moved to the 737400, then the A330-300, and finally was promoted to the Boeing 777-200ER in 1998. His strong track record and seniority resulted in him becoming a typewriting instructor and an examiner as well, effective in November 2007. His penultimate flight as a pilot in command was a return flight to Denpasar Bali on March 3rd. At just 53 years old, he had 8,659 hours of flying time on the 777-200 and 18,423 hours in total. He had a wife and three children. The first officer completed his training in 2008. His first fleet posting was on the Boeing 737-400 as a second officer until May 2010. He was promoted to first officer in May 2010 and was on the fleet until August 2012. But at the end of 2012 to November 2013, he was promoted to the A330-300 and the Boeing 777-200. At just 27 years old, he had 2,813 hours of flying time in total, with 39 hours on the 777. For reference, the pilot had flown 39 hours within two weeks before the crash. The first officer's little experience may have been a factor in the crash, however he was considered to be professional and a very talented pilot by his colleagues. The weather in March is generally dry with little clouds in the Gulf of Thailand. Winds are almost always light up until 40,000 feet. The infrared image taken by a Japanese satellite shows no significant clouds at that time of the last civilian radar contact with the aircraft. Furthermore, it shows no rain occurred at that time either as well as lightning. Now the meteorological aerodrome report, known as META, issued at midnight, 0100 and 0200 did not report any significant weather phenomena. There was no observations of wind conditions at the last radar contact point, however the nearest upper air observation recorded a temperature of minus 40 degrees celsius and wind from the northeast at 15 knots less than 36,000 feet above sea level. Route planning forecasts show no adverse weather and forecast winds at the last radar contact point were below 20 knots. It was highly unlikely that weather contributed to the crash of MH370.
Throughout the fly of MH370, the aircraft communicated with the Inmarsa Indian Ocean Region I-3 satellite and the GES in Perth, Australia. At 1.07 am, the SATCOM system was used to send a standard ACOS report, normally sent every 30 minutes, and the message also indicated the remaining fuel on board. The ACOS reports expected at 1.37 and 2.07 am were not received. The next SATCOM communication was a logon request from the aircraft at 2.25. From that point until 11 past 8, SATCOM transmissions indicate the link was available, although not used for any voice. ACOS or any other services besides ground-to-air telephone calls were not answered. At 19 past 8, the last SATCOM transmission was initiated. Now the link was available for most of the flight, excluding a period between 22 and 78 minutes and another period of less than 8 minutes. The absence of any aircraft initiated handshakes, but success of ground initiated handshakes suggests power was maintained to the SATCOM. Data from the last 7 handshakes were used to help establish the most probable location of the aircraft. Initially, only the first 6 of these handshakes were considered to be complete. The seventh and the last handshake that was automatically initiated by the aircraft was originally assessed as a partial handshake. Subsequent analysis confirmed the seventh handshake could be used to determine the most probable flight path. The Boeing 777-200ER that operated MH370 was equipped with two crash protected data recorders, a solid state flight data recorder also known as a black box or the SSFDR and a solid state cockpit voice recorder or the SSCVR. The flight data recorder is located in the tail of the plane above the ceiling. It receives and stores aircraft parameters from various aircraft systems and sensors in a crash protected solid state memory drive. The flight data recorder system automatically turns on anytime the engine is starting up or running or when the aircraft is in the air. It's powered by the right AC transfer bus which is powered by the engine generators or the auxiliary power unit generator. If both of these are switched off or break down, the SSFDR will cease to operate. It has a recording capacity of 25 hours and it can record over 1300 parameters and the 25 most recent flight hours. The most recent download of this data was the annual readout in September 2013. It can sustain a 3400 g-force for 6.5 milliseconds. It can withstand temperatures of 1110 degrees celsius for 30 minutes and it can survive as deep as 20,000 feet in the ocean. It should be noted that the SSFDR is not designed to float in water as it would sink with the tail of the aircraft anyway. The cockpit voice recorder is located adjacent to the flight data recorder and it records the latest 2 hours of audio from the cockpit. It detects the cockpit sounds and the flight crew communications. Both devices are equipped with locator beacons and they can broadcast a radio signal to help search teams locate the devices for a minimum of 30 days. However, if not located in this time, it's almost impossible to find in the ocean. The devices for MH370 were never found and they will likely never be found in the vast Indian Ocean. It was discovered that two of the passengers on board were travelling together with stolen passports. This was a major breach of security, however it's only mentioned once in the entire report. All that is mentioned about the passengers is that they were travelling on stolen passports and discovered to be Iranian citizens. Malaysian police named one of them as Puria Nur Muhammad Mehdad, aged 18, and said he was probably migrating to Germany. Interpol identified the other as Delava Saeed Muhammad Riza, age of 29. Experts have said that this is relatively common in the region regarding as a hub for illegal migration. Malaysia's police chief said the younger Iranian was not likely a member of a terrorist group. But what's interesting about this statement is that he only mentions the younger person and he states nothing about the older one. Interpol secretary said that the two men had travelled from Doha in Qatar to Kuala Lumpur using the Iranian passports and they switched to the stolen Italian and Austrian passports to board the Malaysian flight. However, reports from Thailand suggest that the tickets bought by the two men 
routing them to Amsterdam via Beijing, had been booked through a Thai travel agent and an Iranian middleman. Despite the evidence which suggests that the men were simply en route to Amsterdam, it seems incredibly suspicious to not cover this in the final report, especially when things like details of the mango steamed fruit in a cargo hold were included. Extensive research by the MH370 Search Strategy Group has concluded that the aircraft ended its flight in the Southern Indian Ocean. They have reached this conclusion as a result of analysis of signals transmitted by the aircraft's satellite communications terminal to the Inmarsat Indian Ocean Region satellite. They searched over 1,200 square kilometers, and a further search was carried out by the US company Ocean Infinity which covered an area over 112,000 square kilometers north of the area covered by the ATSB. No wreckage of the aircraft has been found after the completion of the search, however several floating components and debris, many confirmed to be from MH370, have been found as far as the southeastern coast of Africa. After a number of assessments, more than 20 items were considered for further examination. They were found on the eastern coast of Africa and Madagascar. The first item is the right flaperon, confirmed to be from MH370. Examination of the damages revealed that the hinge fittings were fractured into places at the level of the leading edge and on the lower surface of the flaperon. The leading edge of the flaperon showed dents and cracks. This indicates that the right outboard flap was most likely in the retracted position and the right flaperon was probably in the neutral position or close to it. It suggests that the landing was not a controlled water ditching, but rather an unexpected or an intentional crash landing. Barnacles found on the flaperon were examined in detail by marine biologists. However, the findings did not narrow down the location of the wreckage or the crash site, as the species can be found in many areas around the world and they're not specific to one location. Furthermore, two pieces of debris are almost certain from the cabin interior, suggesting that the aircraft may have been broken up. However, there is insufficient information to determine if the aircraft broke up in the air or at the time of impact with the water. Out of all of the pieces that were tested so far, no traces of explosion were found. Despite over four years of investigation, these findings don't explain why MH370 would drop off radar so suddenly. For that to happen, there'd have to be a catastrophic failure resulting in the disintegration of the aircraft, however we know the aircraft flew for many hours after this. A possible reason is depressurization as a result of window blowout. It would mean that the pilots rapidly descend to get denser air with more oxygen available, dipping below radar coverage, since radar contact requires line of sight. However, this scenario seems incredibly far-fetched. Murder-suicide is also a plausible cause for the crash. The pilot or the first officer could have intentionally crashed the plane, but why would he have flown for an additional 6 hours? Experts say it was so the plane could disappear permanently. After civilian radar contact was lost, the aircraft made a left turn towards Penang. They mentioned that he could have depressurized the plane, incapacitating the passengers, the crew, and possibly even the accompanying pilot or the first officer. It would be logical for the person who took controls to incapacitate everybody on the plane so that he could avoid interference from the back and in the cockpit and prevent people from trying to use satellite phones to call for help. It's an indirect route from where radar contact was lost to the point where the last known location of the aircraft was. So why would the pilot or the first officer fly over it? The pilot, Zahari Ahmad Shah, was born in Penang, so he could have taken the plane on an intentional diversion to his birthplace for personal reasons. They also say the route was pre-planned by one of the flight deck crew. They suggest that it was planned so that the aircraft would avoid radar contact. Analysis of the pilot's flight simulator revealed a course that started in Kuala Lumpur, followed by the flight plan of MH370, until a left turn at the same Aigari waypoint where civilian radar contact was lost. The route would have ended in the Indian Ocean with no place to land, suggesting that the pilot had planned this. It's either an extreme coincidence or careful planning by the intelligent pilot described by his colleagues. However, the Royal Malaysia Police concluded that there was no unusual activities on the computer other than game-related flight simulations. 
Furthermore, the pilot had no life insurance policy, which would ensure his family received money, which is unusual in this case of a planned suicide, and CCTV recordings at the airport before the flight were compared with other times he flew, and nothing unusual came about this. The evidence presented to us strongly suggests that the moment of impact with the ocean was uncontrolled as the flaps were retracted and the cabin interior debris suggests that the plane broke up. However, it's unclear whether it happened in the air or on impact with the water. There's no evidence of explosions inside the aircraft either. In a controlled water ditching, which would be used in an attempt to save lives, flaps would be set to full in order to reduce the airspeed. However, 3 meter waves were recorded at the predicted time of impact, meaning that even a controlled landing would incur significant damage to the aircraft. And there's still no way to know what caused the crash itself. Was it murder, suicide, or was it a catastrophic failure? The sad truth is, is that we may never know what happened to Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. There are significant gaps in the research of the investigation team which needs to be addressed. For example, there was no analysis regarding the two passengers travelling on stolen passports. Over 100 years ago, in 1912, the Titanic sunk. Just under 75 years later, with modern technology, we found it. We may find the aircraft in the future, whether it's accidentally or purposefully. However, for now, we must look at what happened to MH370 and work to stop things like this happening in the future. The International Civil Aviation Organization has set new requirements for flight data recorders effective in 2020, which would allow us to find out what happened in the event of another crash. MH370 will remain, for decades to come, the greatest mystery of the 21st century or even of all time. The fear of the unknown haunts families of the passengers who are still seeking closure from the incident. We dedicate this video to the families, the friends and the loved ones of the passengers and the crew of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370.